he just had something about him. Not a bit of a mentor, a huge mentor. Oh, check it out, it's John Stewart. Yeah. <laughs> Mark was probably one of the most innovative bass players I've seen. Those who understood music and who were passionate about music were going to get it. It was brilliant. He rocked it, he danced, he sang, he sweated. painful things we ever ever had to do. He was not not doing anything. He wanted just to come and go as he pleased and not work and not go to school and not be productive. When he would come home the whole family became very tense and it was um, it was uncomfortable, it was unpleasant, it was scary. There were a lot of people like him in those days, in the 60s. There were a lot of teenagers that were rebelling. Rock music was just the beginning of those days, you know. It's hard to imagine, but it really was very different. We would get reports of Mark's rebellious nature, you know, the way he wanted to dress, the way he wanted to wear his hair, and... Uh... So Harold took a choice. Get a job and go to work, go back to college, or he could come. Clearly, from the beginning, you know, was marching to his own tune. He wasn't always your regular fellow. We didn't know much of where, where he was. We get postcards. We used to send mm -hmm. postcards. But did we hear from him when he was in Brazil and Alaska yeah, I remember and so forth? Yeah, getting. I remember getting yeah. a card or two from Alaska. To Alaska. When he went off to San Francisco and then he worked in the tuna cannery. I didn't want to know a lot of what he was doing, frankly. I knew where he was most of the time. And he went all through Central America. He spent some time in police collecting animals. He went on further into South America through Peru and came into Brazil the back way. He ended up in this little makeshift band. And that was his first real relationship with a woman, I think. Her name was Lalu. His whole adventure was so foreign to us. He was searching, I think, what he was doing. There's a lot of instruments with just one or two strings all around the world. And it's interesting because every string has every note. He began to make a name for himself as a musician. And his band was starting to really take off. I started out on one string because that was the easiest. Well, you play the, the bottleneck on a two-string bass. Is that your idea? Was that your idea to, to do I that? I guess. Started jamming with Dana and got a drummer and recorded some things. And just sort of grew. Me llamo Mark Sandman, Billy Conway, Dana Carly. He did it. <laughs> He'd be like, I'm going to have a super hot funk band. He did it. I'm going to do this rockabilly, this like, you know, roots rock mix. He did it. He just, it's almost like he just, it just took him a while to digest the losses maybe of his brothers. These boys are gone. It was biblical. That's why when Mark, you know, at Mark's funeral, to watch his parents and to be like, this woman has laid three sons in the grave. What the fuck? 
You gotta be, you know, you couldn't wrap your head around the pain. When we lost Barn Sandman, you embraced us. And we will never forget what you did for us on that day. So today we come back with our children to sing, to love, and to remember. That's it. manager was like, why are we doing this show? And he butted heads with her and made the decision to come. And, and then the Zions. That's what I remember. 5,000 people in silence. I just remember putting my sax down and going over there and just yelling at them to hang in there. Hold on. Apparently Mark was a huge fan of Ennio Morricone. Hardly ever think about it without thinking about what Joe Strummer said. Ideally, Morphine would have played this year. Which is, if you're a musician and you love what you're doing... But Ennio Morricone played instead. And your time comes and it happens when you're doing what you love in a beautiful place on a beautiful night. I think Mark would have liked that in, in every one of the artists he loved the most. That's what poetry is for, you know? 